Hey, good afternoon. I want to welcome you to our Oikos Teaching Digital Online Church Community. We have been discussing the question, does God control all things at all times? So again, we're just doing a little mini-series within our series on the Oikos, what that looks like. And what we've been looking at is an interview that John Piper did back in 2017. The exact interview can be found on the website. Check out the notes. All the sermon notes are on the website, both for the uh, online digital community and the in-house church. Uh, when I preach Sunday mornings in-house at the church, so go there. All the um, videos are on YouTube under the church channel. Go there. All this can be found on the church website. So please avail yourself to that. Go to the church website. Check it all out. If you want to donate to the ministry, that's on the church website too. We make it real easy. Online donation. Or you can do it the old-fashioned way. Write a check. Throw it in the mail. Either way. Whatever's comfortable for you. So again, I want to remind you that we're just taking this interview that John Piper did and kind of pulling it apart not because we're trying to bash him, prove him wrong, anything of that nature. It's just anytime someone shares the Word of God with us, we ought to be good Bereans, go to the Word of God, check it out to make sure what they're saying is true. And as I've told you in the past, always do that with me. Check out, make sure what I'm sharing with you is actually from the Word of God. Now again, you may not agree with what I'm saying, but if you can find it in the book, I mean, it's there. That's what we want to make sure. What is being said is actually in the book, or at least the principle of it's in the book, or the understanding of it's in the book, and it's not just something we're making up. So, again, a lot of these different doctrines uh, can obviously be found in the book, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to this point here in a, in a couple minutes, but I just want to bring it out now. we got to understand the context, not the context of Scripture, but what's the context of our understanding of the Word of God? What is our bare foundation? God spoke that to me last week. I shared that in-house Sunday with the church. It really helped me out. It really um, opened up my understanding because what we're talking about in-house is how do we honor governmental authorities, especially with those you don't agree with and some of the things they might do, especially during this pandemic time. So go to the website, check it out. Those are all there too. Sorry for the little diversion. Let me get back to this. So we're talking about, does God control everything in life all the time? He's always in control. So again, John Piper's interview, he broke it into five different categories. I've been sharing that with you. This week, I'm going to give you those categories. The first one he says is, how does God work? And he used Ephesians 1.11 like we shared with you when we talked about that. I think it was in video two, possibly. But he kind of addressed that question, is God in control or not? And he used Ephesians 1.11 for his answer. The second category he calls, he's over all. And this is a quote from the interview. It says, second, God governs all human plans and acts. This is where John dealt with the sovereignty of God. When we talked about the sovereignty of God at that time, is God sovereign? What does it mean to be sovereign? So... He addressed that in that category, and we've kind of already looked at that. Next category he uses, he calls the causer. And another quote from the interview says this, Third, behind human acts, the Bible writers assume God. This is amazing. Here, Amos 3.6. So now he's going to quote Amos 3.6. It says, is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? That's in Amos 3.6. Now John goes on to says, Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? The answer is no. Well, what is the implication? The implication is the biblical writer assumes every kind of event that comes to a city is ultimately from the Lord. He raises it with a rhetorical question that can't be explained any other way. That's his mindset. And then I thought it was interesting on the side of the page, um, when you're looking at the interview over on the side, there's a couple quotes that were there, and this quote is sitting there, and it says this. I just had to, I just had to put it here. It says, It's arrogant to think you're in control. 
God is in control. So see what I just did? I took off my glasses. So what he's saying, it's arrogant for me to think I just took off my glasses. God made me do that. Or it's arrogant to think that this shirt I put on after I showered and shaved and cleaned up because I didn't want you to get all wigged out on camera and think this was a horror movie versus a sermon. Um, so I chose this shirt, but apparently I didn't choose this shirt because I guess God's in control and he made me choose this shirt. So see where a lot of this can go. So this, this is an important thing we need to look at and understand when we're talking about is God in control of every single event, of every moment, of every day, uh, uh, however you want to couch it. So the next category John uses is this. He says, if the, if the Lord wills. So, quote, fourth, this one is sweeping like the first one. God's sovereign will governs all daily activity. So God's sovereign will governs all daily activity here in James 4, 13 through 15. And I just ended it there. And maybe we'll go and look at that verse sometime and talk about that. But if God wills, and then the last one, this is interesting too. The last category he uses as permitting or controlling, quote, Lastly, God's permission of Satan or man to act is nevertheless part of God's ultimate design and final control. I'm trying to respond here to someone who says, well, God doesn't control everything, but he permits a lot of things. I'm saying that's right. He certainly does permit lots of things. How should we understand an all-knowing God with perfect foreknowledge permitting something in his infinite wisdom. So honestly, when I read the interview, and like I said, we've been kind of going through it, but we've really been diverting a little bit and kind of asking our own questions in this context. I just find John's categories and his answers just all kind of disjointed and all over the place. And, and I found this interesting. This, this was the narrator talking at the very beginning of the interview. It says, and I've read this to you before. Many of us are convinced from Scripture that God is absolutely sovereign. He can do whatever He wants to, and He can do it whenever He wants to. He has that kind of power. But does that mean God controls all things at all times? So again, we've got to understand this in context. And this is what I was saying earlier. This is what the Spirit spoke to me last week when I was... When we look at scripture, it's obvious we see um, conflicting scriptures or scriptures that seem to conflict. They were very blatant when we were talking about government. Again, go and watch Sunday's message. They're blatantly two sides. I mean, what do you do when you have that? What do you do when uh, you have scriptures, which I found was interesting in John's interview? He didn't bring up the ones I've already been bringing up about, you know, God gave authority to man, like we talked about last week in, in Psalms, where we have control and all that stuff. He never addresses those. So how do we address those type of uh, situations when we see in the scripture one thing and then seemingly something the exact polar opposite? So I think context is important. And I don't mean reading scripture in context. This is what the Spirit was sharing with me that we need a foundational context from which we come from, a basic understanding of the Word of God. So let me read this also in the interview, this quote, because remember he talked about Ryan's question from Jacksonville, Florida. I didn't read this part to you. So Ryan starts out by saying this before he asks the question. He says, Pastor John, I thank God for using A.W. Pink's book, The Sovereignty of God, and your book, Spectacular Sins, to reveal the biblical truth of Calvinism to me. Now, I hope you just saw a glaring issue with Ryan's comment right there. I mean glaring. What did he just say? He credits two earthly authors for revealing biblical truth in his life. He says, I want to thank A.W. Pink and you for giving me an under biblical understanding 
and seeing the truth biblically of Calvinism in the Bible. You know, for me, I want my context of biblical truth based in revelational truth revealed to me by the Holy Spirit, not truth based from a book that a man wrote. Because what's this telling you right off the bat? Just think about it a minute. He, this kid Ryan and many others, I'm not picking on him. I'm just using his statement to bring this point across. He's saying, I read these two books. They made sense to my intellectual understanding. So now I'm buying into this biblical doctrine, which we call Calvinism. And I thank God for you two authors. Is that how biblical truth is supposed to work? Is that the context from what we want to build upon biblical truth? John 16, 13. Let me remind you of this. This is from the Passion Translation. Jesus is speaking and says, but when the Spirit, Spirit giving, when they, excuse me, but when the truth giving spirit comes, when the truth giving spirit comes, he will unveil the reality of every truth. He is the revealer of truth. The Holy Spirit is the revealer of truth. So again, as the Passion Translation always does, it, it clarifies or expands somewhat that portion of scripture. It says this, the Greek word for truth is reality, not doctrine. Did you catch that? The Greek word for truth is reality, not doctrine. It is the application of truth that matters, not just superficial knowledge. This kid got knowledge from the books he read. That's okay. But how did that turn into a reality? How does that turn into truth that he applies in his life? Because we're not looking for doctrine. We're not looking for superficial intellectual knowledge. We are looking for revelational truth that we may walk out daily our God-given destiny. So again, John 16, 13 says this, but when the truth-giving spirit comes, he will unveil the reality of every truth within you. Not a book you read, not some preacher. The Spirit of God will reveal the reality of every truth within you. He won't speak his own message, but only what he hears from the Father. And he will reveal prophetically to you what is to come. So not only will he reveal truth to you, but he'll reveal what's to come to everybody. Not just the prophets, but I don't want to digress off on that little rabbit trail. So... This is part five of our little mini series. I didn't know it would go this long. And I'll be honest with you, from what I've been studying out, it's going to go a little bit longer because this is important. We really got to understand this issue of God, who's in control, who has authority, who has rulership. This isn't just something that this is important. We especially need to know it in these end times if we're going to walk this out properly and biblically. So, Let's just recap where we've already gone, <clears throat> where we've already been. And this, this message might be a little bit shorter than the others. I don't know. I'm trying to keep them all under 30 minutes. Um, so that's why there will be many of them instead of, you know, this could be a three-hour series if it was going the way I was studying it out today. So let's recap what we've already addressed biblically and not from little, some little booklet that I've written. Sorry for the sarcasm here, but again, don't derive your doctrine from a book that some other guy has written. Get it from the Holy Spirit, who is the revealer of all truth. That's why Jesus says, I got to go so I can send him. Jesus left so he could send him. Rely on him, trust in him to reveal to you all truth revelational truth that you may walk out your own divine destiny. And again, as I've said in the past, your revelational truth is going to be different than my revelational truth in different areas because we're walking a different path. That is okay. So, is God sovereign? Yes. Why? Because he can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it? No. 
Why is God sovereign? Because he's the creator of all things and there is no other one like him. That's what makes him sovereign. He's the top dog. He's it. There is nobody else like him. He is sovereign. Now, who has rulership on the earth? Humanity does. Why? Because that's how God set it up in his original design. Those are the scriptures we looked at last week. You know, because he's sovereign, he determined when he made the earth and he made mankind, his new creation called humanity, he decided he's going to give them dominion upon the earth that he created. He can do that. He's sovereign. He's sovereign. So he made an executive decision. I'm making humanity and I'm going to let them rule and reign upon the earth. And we looked at all those scriptures last week. So this week I want to address this question. Now we're getting down to some nitty gritty, okay? We're not just going to like willy nilly, oh, is God in control? Yes or no? Why? Because he's sovereign. Why? Because he created everything. And just leave all this surface. No, we need to dig into some of this stuff. Because uh, for all too long, Christians have been so surface, you know, they, they've been, uh, I can't say it that way, God. <laughs> it says, they've been on the milk too long, you know, drinking milk. It's time to get some meat. It's time to like grow. Meat is what builds muscle and energy and endurance, not the milk. So... Here's the question I want to ask us this week. As it relates to man and God's authority that he gave man over the earth, how did the fall of man affect God's original design as it relates to man's rulership upon the earth? So when man fell, Genesis chapter 3, ate the fruit, Eve ate the fruit, man fell, hid themselves from God, all that whole story of Adam and Eve eating the fruit. How did that affect the dominion that God gave man upon the earth? Now, we're going to take this slow. We're going to kind of pull it apart a little bit because we got to, I don't want to kind of leave any stones unturned here. So let me make this statement. Man lost his authority. Now, this is my statement, okay? Man lost his authority over the earth when he sinned against God through his disobedience to God. The devil then stole man's God-given authority from him through his obedience to him, or the devil. Now, let me be honest with you and have complete integrity here. There is no clear-cut scriptures that state the point I just made. I'll be honest with you, there isn't. We must look at multiple scriptures in order to draw this conclusion. And that is if you choose to draw that conclusion. Because those who believe God's in control will probably draw a different conclusion than where I'm going to share these scriptures with you and you can decide what they mean or not. But as I was meditating on this today, because it bothers me when there's kind of not a clear-cut scripture. I mean, it doesn't bother me, bother me, but it just makes life a lot easier when you can point and say, yeah, it's right there. But not everything's so clear-cut in the book. That's why we're supposed to dig it out. That's why we're supposed to be good Bereans and study the Word of God. That's why we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. These are things we ought to be doing instead of just sitting back, listening to me, talking to you over the web, and just sucking it all up, and then you go on and never even check out what I'm telling you, or look up these verses, or go get the notes and pull them apart for yourself. We got to be doing that kind of stuff. So this is what the Holy Spirit spoke to me when I was meditating on this because there is no clear cut, clear cut scripture, but there is a clear cut principle. And if you're following me on Facebook today, you saw me put it up and I'm still fleshing it out and pulling it apart. 
and I think I kind of honed it down to this simple statement. What you submit to is what I felt the Holy Spirit sharing with me in my spirit. What you submit to, you grant authority to over your life. So what you choose to submit to, you are actually giving authority in your life to that thing. Now there's a scripture for that. In James 4, verse 7, give it to you in the Amplified, it said, So submit to the authority of God. Okay, so submit to the authority of God. Resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. So everybody always wants to know how to get the devil off their back. What do I do? Well, I'm submitting to God. Well, I'm trying to resist the devil, all this stuff. Listen to it in the context of what I just stated. What you submit to. See, what you believe in, you will submit to. Okay? I don't really want to get any particular examples. I mean, if God brings up one to help better explain this but I think the scripture explains it pretty well and, and we can see this in the garden and what happened when Adam submitted to the lie that Satan was perpetrating you will not surely die when he chose to obey Satan when he chose to obey the words of Satan over the words of God he then gave Satan authority to work in his life and to steal, kill, and destroy. So what the devil did was then steal his authority because he submitted himself to Satan. Instead of submitting to God, he chose to disobey God in that area with that particular thing. That's why this is so important. That's why some of y'all are struggling with things in your life. You've not submitted that thing to God. You've not submitted that portion of life to God. So you've got some things you're submitted to, some things you are great at, and some things you are really horrible at. Because you haven't submitted them to God. You're still trying to handle them. Or you still believe the lie of the devil that they're not so bad, you can handle it. Well, that's really not sin. Well, God doesn't really look at it the way you think he looks at it or the way that preacher Jim tells you he looks at it. Now, it's not that big of a deal. And that's the problem. That's the principle. This is how I think, not think, this is how I know from revelational truth that the Spirit of God gave me how the devil ended up taking Adam's authority and before we get too far in this, I do want to touch on the authority piece. So I don't want to belabor this anymore. But again, James 4, 7. Check it out. Look at it up in different versions. So submit to the authority of God. When you submit to the authority of God, you now have authority of God working in your life. Now you can resist the devil. You can stand firm against him and he will flee from you. So first, let's look at this issue of authority because I don't think we understand authority very well. When we speak of authority, it is always in the terms of delegated authority. Man does not have absolute authority over all things on the earth for whatever matter, for whatever, you know, we don't have absolute authority. Why? We didn't create it. Man is not sovereign over all things. Only the Lord is sovereign over th all things because he's the creator of all things. So authority is given to us by the one who has all authority. Okay, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This again in the Passion Translation says this. You know this. I've shared this verse many a time. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. It says, then Jesus came close to them and says, all the authority of the universe has been given to me. So who has all authority? Jesus. So when you say you have authority, why do you have authority? He's going to tell us. But who has all absolute authority? Jesus. Why? He was part of creation. Remember, we went back and looked at that last week. Go back and rewatch that again. Go over those scriptures again. You should have already studied them out and checked me out if I was telling you it was true or not. 
Jesus was in part of the creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Okay? Jesus created all. He has all absolute authority. He's sovereign. He's Lord. Now, because of that, he says this. <clears throat> and again, the, the, the Passion Translation gives a clarification. He says, there is a sentence found in the Arabic that is missing in all but one Greek manuscript, which reads, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So Jesus is saying, look it, I've got all authority, and as the Father sent me, now I'm sending you. Not just them boys, you, and you, sent ones. Verse 19, he says, now go in my authority. You go in my authority. See, if I go in my own authority, I mess it up. I don't have the authority. I have authority because he gave me the authority. It's delegated authority. We have to understand that. Man, I've run into so many Christians say, why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? God gave me authority. God gave me authority. He gave you authority. It's delegated authority. But go back to what I already said. Are you submitted to him? Or are you submitted to something else? Anyway, it goes on. You know that. I'm getting late here, so let me give you this last verse and then take away. Hebrews 2, 5 through 8. I shared this with you last week. But I want to get the very last part of this verse because I didn't explain it and, it. and it fits into what we're saying now. It says, Therefore, it is not angels who will control the future world we are talking about. For in one place the scripture says, and we know that one place is in Psalms. We look at that. We looked at that last week. What are mere mortals that you would think about them or the son of man that you would care about him? Yet, for a little while you made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You gave them authority over all things, okay? God gave mankind authority over all things. Now, when it says all things, it means it left nothing out, okay? Nothing is left out. We have authority over all things. But notice what it says. But we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. Doesn't mean we don't have authority. It means we have delegated authority. And let me put a little bug in your ear, maybe, or, or tweak you a little bit to think about one day we're going to have authority. We have not yet seen all things put under their authority. Ooh, let's not go there. That's another rabbit hole. We don't know if some of you really want to go that deep in that. So man, by his actions, through the fall, gave his delegated authority to the devil. So we're going to look at those verses, like I said, that we, we see clearly. Look at Luke 4, when Jesus, the devil was tempting Jesus, took him on the high mountain. He says, look at, see all this stuff? If you just bow down and worship me, I'll give it to you because it's mine. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 4, I believe, that he's the God of this world. Okay? But let's go to the takeaway. Again, what you submit to, you give authority to over your life. So let me ask you, who are you submitted to? Who are you submitted to? Is Jesus truly your Lord? Have you made him your Lord? You got Jesus? You got him. I'm not asking you if you said a prayer one day. You got him. Is he yours? Is he your Lord? Not Savior. Forget the Savior thing. Is he your Lord? When he's your Lord, he becomes your Savior, your healer, your baptizer, your soon coming king. You get it all when he's your Lord. I don't want just the Savior. I want Lord. He is my Lord. He is the one I am submitted to. He is the one who I will bow a knee to. Him and only him because he's sovereign over all things. Okay? Who are you submitted to? When it comes to your health, who are you submitted to? 
When it comes to your finances, who are you submitted to? Is he your provider? It says in Philippians 4, I forget the exact verse, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Is he your provider or is it your job? Are you submitted to your boss? You're afraid of what your boss would say because you look at him as your provider? See what I mean? You can have areas of your life that you're all set in, but others, not so much. So I don't want to go there. We're pushing up against our mark here. So, you know, God bless you, keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. Until next time, be blessed.